I need you to turn off all your phones. Take your earbuds out, you know the rules. Okay? Let's give her all your attention and I'm turning it to her. Okay, hi everyone. Who here is a senior? Is anyone You're a senior? Right now. Oh, they all are, yeah. <laughs> All right, well, that ruins that. Okay, well, I am, as he said, I am the emergency management coordinator for Des Moines County. Does anybody know what emergency management is? They all should know we've been talking about it all week. What do I do? Anyone? Manage emergencies. That's, that's literally pretty, pretty accurate, but there's actually a lot of things I do. Um, a lot of times when I ask even adults or just people that question, they say, oh yeah, you're, when I call 911, you're that person. And I say, no, I am not that person. Um, I, that's one thing that I actually don't do. Um, so anyways, I'll start with uh, who I am and how I got here. So these are actual pictures of my real life. That's my cat and my dog, and that's my daughter, Nora. Um, so I am originally from the state of Maine. So I'm from the East Coast. I moved here about five years ago after I met my husband. Um, we worked on a cruise ship together for about five years. Um, we lived out in Washington State. Um, and then we have our daughter, and he's from here. So we moved back here. Uh, before I met him, I actually went to the University of New Haven in Connecticut, which is one of the top experiential education schools in the country for criminal justice um, and emergency management. So I got my bachelor's degree in criminal justice, investigative services, and law enforcement administration. And then I had the opportunity to go back for my master's degree for free, which you don't actually ever hear of that. So I took that chance. Um, and I started in criminal justice and it was really similar to my bachelor's degree and I thought it was kind of boring. Um, toyed around with what I wanted to be when I grew up because I still didn't really know. Um, said I don't really want to be a cop. Wouldn't be very good at that. Um, so what do I want to be? And I thought, well, man, I'm already in the criminal justice realm. I got to kind of stick in this direction. I'm going to go into national security. And I thought, I'll do national security. Yeah, sure. I was, current, I was working for a group called the Institute for the Study of Violent Groups. So basically what we did was we used open source data like Facebook. Um, at the time it was MySpace, which you guys probably don't know about. Um, MySpace, what? It was national what? What? It was national what? Like what was National it? security, yeah. So um, so I used, we used open source data Google, anything, to track and trace terrorist movements around the country, around the world. Um, we also did projects like bulk cash seizures of drug runs throughout the country. So we would basically look at where drug money, drugs, big, big seizures of drugs, how they were seized, where they were seized from, um, who seized them, um, and we basically would be able to map out where the cartels were running the drugs through the United States. So I did that, so I thought, cool, national security, I can do this. And I started that and I said, ooh, I don't really like this. So I, what do I wanna be, what do I wanna be? So I thought, I wanna go into something, I wanna help people. Um, and just about that time, there was a really large earthquake in Nepal and people were literally buried under the rubble. And I thought, that's what I wanna do. I want to work for the American Red Cross. I want to, I want to go, I want to be deployed to areas of destruction and I want to help people. So I'm going to go into emergency management. So that's what I did. I graduated top of my class um, and I went into emergency management. But then, of course, things happen, life happens and uh, my boss at the time died very unexpectedly and that's when I joined the cruise ship. I went in a totally different direction and did that for a while. And then I ended up here. So I applied for emergency management positions for 
about five years before I actually was able to even get one. Um, you know, how many of you have been told, get good grades, go to college, you'll get a job? I mean, unfortunately, that's not always the case. Uh, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of other people competing for the same jobs, and how many, how many people, how many emergency management jobs are in Southeast Iowa? Very few. So um, when the opportunity came up here in Southeast Iowa, um, actually in a part-time position, I applied for it and I got that. And so that's how I got my foot in the door as an emergency management coordinator. So I was part-time for about three or four months and then the actual coordinator, she announced her retirement and that's how I got in the door for the full-time. So the hiring process, required documents, how many of you have a resume? You have a resume, you have a resume, great. How many of you have ever filled out a job application? Yeah. Uh, so I needed those things. I needed um, a cover letter. Have you ever had to do a cover letter? Yeah, I needed references. I needed just a whole plethora of things. I needed my college transcripts um, to prove that I actually went. Um, so I did that. Uh, I filled out the application, um, and it took about a month for them to get back to me for an interview. So there was 18 people that applied for my position because, like I said, there just isn't a lot of positions available for emergency management in Southeast Iowa. And I was lucky enough that they chose me. So after the interview, they did a background check on me, which is just to make sure that I've never been in trouble with the law. I'm a good person, um, I am who I say I am, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then I spent about three months training with the former coordinator. So she had been here for 28 years. So she kind of knew that, and she had kind of basically created emergency management for Point County. So I had a lot to learn from her. So I asked you guys this before, what is emergency management? Um, I do a plethora of things, but we really like to try to stick to these four kind of pillars of emergency management. Mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. Um, everything that I do sort of falls into one of these categories. So uh, preparedness, uh, who hears the sirens the first Wednesday of every month? Who gets on Facebook and sees, why are the sirens going off? Who sees that? I do. And it's just a test. Uh, it's a test of the outdoor warning system to make sure that it works, to make sure that we know what to do, um, to make sure that you hear it, et cetera, et cetera. Training and exercise, it's my responsibility to make sure that not only am I prepared, but that the volunteer fire departments are prepared, uh, the police departments are prepared. Um, if there's any grant money out there for trainings that I can get that for our county, um, that's another piece of my job. And then I'm in charge of writing our emergency response plans. If you ever get really bored, you can come down to my office. I have thousands of pages of emergency response plans and they are very tedious and pretty much I don't think anybody's ever read them except for me um, so each year I'm responsible for updating 20% of that so there's 15 plans in total um, and then there's some other plans as well but 15 core plans um, and I have to update 20% of those response um, you all I'm hopeful aware that there was a tornado that went through last month Yarmouth area um, so it's my job to respond to that. Um, I do damage assessments. I speak to local homeowners. I connect them with state resources. I, I report back to the state to let them know what happened, how much damage we have. Um, I let the governor know that, hey, we need you to turn on a declaration assistance so that we can get more assistance down in Des Moines County. So by doing that, we had a disaster de declared 
by the governor for Des Moines County. And by doing that, we are able to get indiv individual assistance and um, other assistance available to us that isn't normally available. Recovery, um, this piece is, so after disaster goes through, how do we recover from that? I mean, imagine if a disaster came down Roosevelt Avenue, tornado came down Roosevelt Avenue and just tore out all the light poles, uh, took out all the electricity, took out all the water, we had no drinkable water. Um, this just happened in Western Iowa. They had no cell phones, no drinkable water, they had no electricity. I mean, what do you do? So that's my job. How do you pick up not just a couple trees? How do you pick up thousands of trees? Where do you put them? Who picks them up? That's up to me to figure out, to coordinate that. Um, luckily, we have, again, state resources available. If state resources get overwhelmed, then we have the federal resources available. Um, housing, so if you saw pictures like I did of Western Iowa, I mean, people's houses were just flattened. Where do you put all those people? They are now displaced from their house. It's not just one or two people. I mean, it's entire families. Where do you? You call the Red Cross. They'll open temporary shelters. Um, they'll, they'll literally bring in housing. Um, and then you call in the federal government and you say, hey, we need help and they'll come and they'll help you. So that's my job to assess the situation and report it. Um, and then health and social services. So like, like I said, their houses were totally flattened. I mean, if you take medicine and your house is totally flattened, your medicine went with it. So how do you get your medicine? Um, things like that. So these are all things that I have to think about. Um, and then mitigation, which is a word that a lot of people don't know. Um, mitigation basically means that we look at issues in our county. So there's usually, in the past, there has been a lot of flooding at the Burlington waterfront, right? Just year after year, there's just, it always floods, right? So we said, hmm, this is a big issue. It costs a lot of money, costs a lot of resources. How do we fix this? What can we do to mitigate this, this issue? So what we do is we apply for grants from the federal government and we are able to build up that waterfront, which is what they've been working on. Um, and now our flood line, it went from something like 13, 14 feet of water. Now the river has to be up to like 18 feet before we do anything before we even start to panic. Um, and then I think we could go up to like 24 feet before it even will topple over anything. So that is huge. That's a huge mitigation project for Burlington. So it's things like that, improved infrastructure that I look at. Um, I also write plans so that we can apply for these grants. So we have a, a mitigation grant that we have to write in order to be eligible for these types of grants. Yeah, so I went over this a little bit. Uh, preparedness again, um, a big piece of my part of preparedness is grant writing. So it's, it sounds like I kind of do exciting things, but I'll say a lot of what I do is, I do a lot of paperwork. I do a lot of computer work. I do a lot of writing, um, which is good for the county. Um, but that's kind of the boring part of my job. You don't want the exciting kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So um, this past month, this past April, was one of the busiest torna tornado seasons uh, to date. And um, this was my first official month by myself. <laughs> so it was a perfect month for me to start. Um, and then, so something that we do for preparedness is we have mass notification systems. So there's several ways to receive mass notifications. So 
something I always hear about the sirens is, well, I'm inside my house and I can't hear the sirens. Well, that's because they're for outdoor purposes. But there's other ways to receive mass notifications. So we have something called Alert Iowa. Um, and you can sign up for this. You can tailor it to what you want. It'll send you text messages. It could call you. Um, it can send you an email. Um, and you can do it for just tornadoes. Or you could do it for all different types of weather hazards. Um, so it's really cool because you can tailor it to kind of what you want. Um, other things that we do, we have, let me think. Here is another one just lost it in my brain. What was it? It'll come to me. Oh well. Anyways, response. Uh, so we talked about this a little bit. Uh, the, what's the most important piece of disaster response? Preservation of life. So, um, <laughs> my former boss, uh, she was the emergency management coordinator for 28 years, and there was a massive flood in 2008. This is before my time, before I lived here, um, but she is scarred deep from this because there was pigs that were eating, literally eating, at the levee. Do you know what a levee is? Levees are built to protect us from the river flooding. So it's kind of towards rural, more rural areas in Des Moines County. But they are levee and drainage systems built to protect areas. Dripping mounds of dirt and sand. Yeah, and they're built by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, they're very strategically built. Um, we do not, we don't mess with them, we don't dig at them because of the way that they're built. So a bunch of pigs got loose because it was flooding and they were trying to dig their way through the levee, trying to get away from the flood water. And she had to make the choice. These pigs are going to ruin this levee, and then we're going to flood all this area, and these people, their houses, everything is going to flood. Or do we shoot these pigs and stop them from doing this? So she made the tough decision of preservation of life is more important than the life of these pigs. So she gave the order to shoot these pigs, and she got a lot of heat from media, a lot of heat from PETA, uh, but ultimately our number one priority is preservation of life. So number two priority, preservation of property. So houses would have been destroyed, uh, farmland would have been destroyed, um, and the farmers who owned the pigs, they understood and they knew that it was a, a necessary evil that had to be done and, and they had no problem with it. So that's just part of the job, I guess. So we talked a bit about this as well. Um, something I didn't really touch on is donations management. So one piece of my job that kind of becomes a disaster within a disaster is when a disaster happens on a mass level, so um, I'll give you an example. I, I went to college just outside of Sandy Hook Elementary School. Anybody know what that is? It was a mass shooting of kids. Um, and so I was there just a few days later um, with the kids, the younger, the kids we were playing, um, but there was just truckloads and truckloads and truckloads of teddy bears and cookies and toys and just things coming in, just just donations of just things that they didn't need. People want to help, right, after a disaster. People say, I'm going to help. I need to do something. I want to help so much. Um, New Orleans, uh, after, after um, the big hurricane came through New Orleans, they said, um, people literally in Maine, where I live, Churches got together and they said, just throw everything in a trailer. We'll just drive right down to New Orleans. We're gonna help these people. And they literally would get down there and the police were lining the, the freeway and they said, turn around and go back. We do not want your stuff. People were sending stuff with bed bugs. People were sending stuff with fleas. I mean, people want to do good, 
but in the moment of a disaster, I mean, if you're sending couches and, and clothing to people who don't even have houses, what are they gonna do with that? So we call it a disaster within a disaster. So literally we have agreements with different organizations in the county to deal with donations if there is a disaster because it becomes such a big project. Um, same with volunteering. It's so great, you know, you get people who come out um, after a disaster and say, I live in this community and I really wanna help this community. And we say, awesome, great. But if you get 300 people who come out and then they start doing their own thing and not following any protocols and then they get hurt, that's another disaster within the disaster. So we like to have some type of span of control. Um, so we have people who then we put in charge of donations and volunteering. So we talked about improved uh, infrastructure, public education. Um, so I come speak to high schools. I am at a lot of different fairs, um, national night out that the police put on in there. Um, sometimes you see the CERT team, the emergency response team out. Um, so we try to get out. It was just used for the suicide. It was, we were just there, yeah. So what do I do exactly is kind of a loaded question. It just depends on the day. Um, there's been a lot of things that, like I said, this past month has just been very busy, so done a lot of things just piling on my desk that have been put on the back burner. Um, but, you know, that's just the name of the game. Um, it can be exciting sometimes and it can be not so exciting sometimes, but such is life. So uh, one question that I thought was kind of interesting was how do I balance it? Um, you know, I, like I said, I have a five-year-old daughter, I'm a wife, um, I'm a sister, I'm a daughter. I, it's, it has been a lot to try to balance it, especially when, like this last month, you know, I work a lot because they, emergencies happen. So I, when there are good days, good sunny days like today, um, Maybe I leave a little bit early, or um, I just try not to take my work home with me. That's a big piece of it. Um, I could sit and think about all the things that I need to do all day. That big stack on my desk, I could sit and think about that all night while I'm home, and um, I really try not to do that. So I have, I have two cell phones. I try to keep my work phone very separate, my work life very separate from my personal life. Um, so any emails or anything that gets sent over the weekend, I try really hard. If it's not important or not pressing, I try not to answer it. Um, so yeah, so it is, it's, it's a balancing act. And as you get older and you grow up and you become adults and you have families, I mean, it, that's just part of it. You know, your kids have baseball games or softball games or Whatever it may be, you just learn to find the, the balance. Any questions? I tried. So now what? Yeah, yeah so, um, well, I kind of fell into it. I, um, I started in criminal justice and I thought, well, I'll never pass the physical agility test to be a cop, so I gotta go some other direction, and then I went into national security, but I thought, you know, this isn't helping people in the way that I wanted to, so I kind of fell into emergency management. What do you think some good characteristics for someone who goes into the should have? So, um, you have to be very flexible. Um, I found that every single day, so I'm a, I am personally a very type A personality. I, I like to have a schedule and I like to be very rigid and I like to know exactly what's happening. Um, in this respect, I have found that you really, really can't live your life that way because things are always gonna pop up. 
um, the schedule might have to change. You might have to work at 10 o'clock at night because the tornado went through, um, and that's okay. Emergencies never happen. Never, no, no. So, shockingly, a lot of tornadoes and things like that they happen at nighttime, which I'm not sure. I'm sure there's some kind of reason why, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Yeah, yeah. So, I, this last <laughs> I this last month I really have been uh, very um, addicted to watching the radar and uh, looking at the weather updates because you never know. So now that the seniors are back, which is just two, two. What are you going to be when you grow up? Mm -hmm. Do you know? You don't know yet? That's okay. I wasted all my time and money and went to college thinking that I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up. And um, I didn't. So take your time in trying to decide what you want to be. Uh, my husband is 33 years old and he still is hemming and hawing about what he wants to be when he grows up. So. Never too late to figure it out. Um, but my best advice is, if you don't know what you want to be, you know, and if you don't want to go to college and you like to do trade work or you like to do woodwork or you like to do electric work, then do an apprenticeship. Do something else. Um, if college isn't for you, school's not for you, then that's okay. There's something else out there for you. Don't waste thousands and thousands of dollars on going to college. I should have done the smart thing and gone to community college for a few years. I have tried about several careers in this, in this field that you don't have to go to college. You really don't. I mean, even there's some police officers that I know that they went straight to the academy after they got out of high school. And I mean, they can retire way before I'll ever be able to retire. Um, and they don't have half the debt that I have. So, you have to weigh your options on what you want to be when you grow up. For sure. So what's the biggest stress for you have? Um, dealing with all the uh, government officials and the paperwork? I think uh, the biggest stress of my job is I'm an office of one. So I'm expected to, to wear many hats and be in many places at once. Um, a lot of times I get pulled in a lot of different directions and um, that can be really stressful. So I don't mind um, dealing with the government. I don't mind that, that's okay. Um, but to, to have to be many people in, in many places at once is stressful. And I think, um, the balancing part of it is pretty stressful as well. Any other questions? Several of you, including myself,